on the internet. We're now live on the internet. That's magic. We're broadcasting. Um, gentlemen, welcome to my humble little show for Valor. Uh, we're into our fifth week now. We've got eight. And, uh, and actually, I'm going to do the intro uh, quickly. And then uh, I'm going to let you guys kind of introduce yourselves. Uh, then I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. And uh, we'll just have a chin mag, really, because um, I'm super excited. John, my, Johnny, my Johnny's going to take away. away. <laughs> this, is pretty Two sets. Two sets. this is this is live i'll talk about terry while johnny's getting his uh his supper uh so look uh, i've got the official party line here where is it Hot off the press. this is this is the version of terry from the internet and then i'm going to ask uh and i'm going to say how i know terry uh and then i'm going to get terry to introduce himself uh this is terry rigby uh, who's, uh, who's been a friend of mine for a number of years now uh, and a massive inspiration to me. Uh, Terry's got an extensive background in health and social care, uh, including a high level of experience commissioning a range of key strategic portfolios in the procurement of uh, a variety of high profile health services for implementation at a citywide level. Wow. You wrote, you wrote that yourself, didn't you? <laughs> Did I really? <laughs> Was that part of my like? Yeah, it must be the CV. Uh, but more importantly, look, uh, Terry. Again, uh, I think uh, Terry was actually the man that introduced me and, and Johnny, um, and we'll get into that. Uh, he's got like a massive background and is a specialist in suicide prevention, mental health and well-being, community cohesion. Um, he's the creative force behind a number of very innovative community programs across the country. Um, qualified applied suicide intervention skills trainer. Um, Fourteen years doing suicide intervention i mean it's a i could do i could read the official line on terry but um i'm just gonna say when i met you you're just a top bloke and uh you're one of you're one of life's good ones do you know what i mean and um we, we met at a conference that terry organized a few years ago called man made in birmingham uh, which was a remarkable day it really was um when you just you kind of bring together the right kinds of people and me uh, but the right kinds of people to, to try and really fix this problem around men's mental health and suicide prevention um, and for that i applaud you and you're 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 a top guy um then in the middle there back from his, uh, his his front door ringing we've got uh johnny benjamin who's a real life mbe uh which is very exciting uh no, no johnny doesn't need a massive introduction uh, he's can you hear me um yeah i've never got a take i've I ordered a takeaway and it's turned up in a box. Have you ever got a takeaway in a box before? That's amazing. Are you, is Amazon doing takeaways now? I there must be now. I've never, yeah. Sorry, I just, that's no, really. No, that's, I don't have a problem with that. Eat your takeaway. I want to know what's in the box. Wow. <laughs> it could be anything. It's just a no, bit I, of rice. I just ordered rice and it's turned up in a massive box. You've got a box of rice. Well, well, it's cooked. It's cooked. It's cooked. I think you need to open this. The last time I had a box, of food delivered to me it was on a rugby tour and i won't tell that story uh it's not a pleasant one uh johnny benjamin uh mbe award-winning mental health campaigner film producer public speaker writer vlogger from london uh queen's honors list 2017 uh johnny was awarded an mbe for his services to mental health and suicide prevention um at the age of 20 johnny was diagnosed with a schizoaffective disorder a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar uh, and he's just gone on from there to make um films um kind of youtubed uh he's made documentaries he's written an amazing book called the man on the bridge he was in a channel 4 documentary the stranger on the bridge um it just goes on and on and again i've known johnny for a number of years now both professionally and personally um and uh you just you're just ace and you're a big inspiration you've done so much for men like me uh and so it's just an absolute joy to have you here with with terry who's who's just on that side of you um Welcome, gents. Uh, we'll talk about some of your kind of journeys and adventures as we go. But um, I just want to ask how you're getting on with lockdown. How's it treating you? Johnny, what's, what's been going on? Ten weeks of being in lockup. Ten weeks. Well, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm living alone. I've been living alone. And uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't, it's so weird. I haven't seen anyone. For, I mean, I've seen people via, um, you know, the internet and stuff. But I haven't seen anyone in person for um 10 weeks wow and it's getting yeah it's um oh shoot my takeaway is leaking sorry um <laughs> what is sorry i was holding the box and it's all just dripped everywhere anyway uh, no, it's all good 
Um, so apart from the box of takeaway, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. It's been all right. I mean, uh, I just miss people. I miss being in yeah. people's presence and hugging them. And yeah, it's really starting to... I'm like my nieces and oh, I don't know. I just, yeah, I'm starting to really miss, really miss people. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm all right. Thanks. Do, you know, do you mind me asking? And then I'm going to get Toe to answer that question. I hope you don't mind it if it's a you know, particularly complicated question to ask. But to someone with quite a complicated mental health condition like you, is, is not seeing people like, is it making it worse? I mean, how is that affecting you? Because it's pretty bad, right? Isolation. Well, I mean, yeah, but there's been periods of my life when, you know, I've, I've, I've chosen to isolate myself. Okay. And I have, again, I haven't seen people for long periods of time. And uh, I think this might sound a bit weird, but I'm, I think I was a bit more maybe well prepared for this than other people were. That maybe been okay. Through, you know, because I've, yeah, I've been through periods of, of complete, total isolation for weeks, months when I've been in bad places. So it's hard, but it's not as hard if, if that makes yeah. sense. No, I understand. I understand. Oh, well, you know, that's good to know. And the, um, Terry, my friend, what have you been doing? How's isolation been treating you? It's okay. Um, I quite like my own, my own space. I've got my daughter living here. She's a she's a key worker. Um, so she she works with, with extremely vulnerable individuals in the residential unit um, in Birmingham. Um, so she's having to work mainly from home, but a couple of days out. Um, I drop into the office kind of once, maybe twice a week, if that. But there's nobody around. It's just it's just everyone is completely separated. Uh, I look forward to the queues for Sainsbury's. That, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know? Once every few days, and, and the next Amazon Prime box comes to the door. But I've not ordered rice, so, you know. So a box uh, of leaking rice. I've not, not not done that. So that, that, that that's an interesting one. But I'll I, give you the name. I'll give you the details. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's a big box as well. This is going to be the topic for the entire show. I can tell. Um, and what it, and it benefits me. There's definitely sometimes benefits to not being able to see certain people, not having to have an excuse. Yeah, that's true. You know, once in a while, I think, oh, I don't have to worry about making an excuse. Lockdowns here, you know. It does. It feels like it's been going on for ages now. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling slightly fatigued by it. Like, uh, the, in the videos from the last five weeks. Obviously, my lockdown hair is getting a bit crazier, and the look in my eyes is getting a bit wilder. And uh, I don't know. Um, I, and we've been going out. We've been sort of doing our walks and taking the dog out. And I got the kids. But we're trying to do jobs and be teachers. And like, it's it has started to affect my mental health. I'm going to be honest. It's kind of it's been complicated. So I'm glad that you you guys are doing all right. Anyway, that's the, that's made me very happy. Um, listen. Uh, it, te Terry, do you mind just giving everyone like a, a quick background to you and what you do so that they understand the kind of context of, of uh, what you've been doing and what you've done for me and, and kind of how we're, uh, how we're connected and things like that? What's Ford for Life? Start there. I mean, Ford for Life I set up in 2012. Uh, it's just a small social enterprise and it's, it's based around suicide prevention, um, but very much on the, on, on the basis that to prevent suicide, to promote mental health. The, the, the two are intertwined. Um, you don't wait till the person gets to the point of being in crisis before we look at putting support in place. We look at what can be done upstream to help a person not end up in that place where they feel they have no other choice but to maybe consider taking their own life. So, I mean, it started years back when I did my degree, the dissertation on, on domestic violence against men. And I, I realised back then, I realised when I was working in commissioning that one of the biggest issues I found was that even though there's a necessity for services that are specifically for women uh, and, and meet women's needs, there was a, there's a dearth of a lack of services that existed in respect of men. When I did the, the work around men and domestic violence as, as um, survivors of domestic violence, there was, I think it was one service in the whole of the country in Milton Keynes. I don't know if it still exists now. Um, it's a similar kind of situation with regard to men, suicide, suicidal thought, and, and those risks that, that, that related to them and, and how it, it's not that it was overlooked, just not talked about so or wasn't yeah. spotted if you like so that that's that's the reason why I, I got into what i got into um and also i got tired of commissioning i got, I got tired of, of buying the services in when i felt that actually maybe i could use the knowledge i had to maybe develop some service for myself and deliver them directly um, yeah get pleasure from that and it, it's it, you feel like you're actually doing something 
Uh, the, the further you go up the management scale, often the, the further you feel away from those people who are there to help. So that was a real challenge, which which is why Man Made kind of came about. And that was that was just sitting down with a group of men in the room and um, discussing how they felt and having a good laugh. And there's some dodgy stories from those meetings, I can tell you. But uh, you do find that a hell of a lot of, about men and what's going on in their minds and how they how they link and how they connect and what the challenges are, which is not discussed. So that's why I do what I do. You know. And it's um, it's really fascinating because I know one. I, I like I, it. Always strikes me that it, it, we don't really get to solve big problems. Like all the big changes in society have started been started by people at the grassroots level. Um, you know, kind of people like like you and me and and, and Johnny and people. And it seems to be where the the biggest systemic changes have come from. And. Uh, it was fascinating when we were talking when we first met about your move from like the inside to outside the system and being and feeling like you could make more change by being outside of the system um, and uh, I, I think this I think the work that, that you and the team in Birmingham do is just astonishing I really do uh, oh and across the entire country and it's it's more grassroots it makes a bigger difference um, and, uh, and and all power to you for doing it honestly um, to, to be fair with you, Pete, the, the man-made conference was, was a wing and a prayer, and we just got really lucky. But I think the only person I really knew, as in had some kind of reputation, was Johnny. Um, as in, he was well-known on the scene, but I mean, yourself, and then um, Jamie Harrington, and then Katie Lambert, who yeah. lost a, a partner to, to yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, and Rohan Kalacharin. Uh, he's, coming, he's, he's coming on next week. Uh, and he's uh, going to have a chat to me about like, multiple marathon running. And these people just happen to be around at the same time um, and were, were available and went through the work and it, it was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Well, it made a difference and it connected a load of people that have stayed connected. So I think that's the efficacy of it. What about you, Johnny? Um, just uh, what, like, what have you been up to in the last uh, sort of 18 months or so? Because um, I think, you know, we could talk about the, the Johnny from the bridge like for a whole hour, but it feels like, you know, the world has moved on slightly. You've moved on slightly from like that part of your your life even though it's really important and you still go out and talk about it hugely but the last couple of years i think when i you know watching how you've progressed and what you've done and um the kind of work that you've started to do and the book and everything seems amazing what's 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 been happening yeah i think the last 18 months i've been really focusing on young people mm -hmm. uh, in particular so set up uh, a charity uh, which is yeah focused on young people and on you know things like prevention and early intervention um which we've yeah kind of talked about i guess already you know how important that because we you know uh well in the uk the average time between your your first symptoms of a mental health issue and then your diagnosis and your treatment is 10 years um which is just it's just ridiculous 10 and years it, 10 years yeah um wow. but i think it well i mean looking at my history i I'd say my me my mental health issues began like around the age of ten, and then it was twenty when I got my diagnosis and I was really unwell. Um, and yeah, I just I mean, I hear it all the time, you know, about waiting lists and you know um, lack of access to uh, mental health services, and then with young people you got the transition from CAMS, the child and adolescent mental health service, to adult mental health service at 18 which just doesn't work for so many people so i just i don't know there's there's a lot that needs to change i think in terms of well mental health in general but particularly i think young people's mental health i mean um we're seeing more and more young people that are struggling and i think because of this period as well i'm really concerned about you know the impact uh well the impact on everyone but again particularly on young people yeah um and i don't think we're going to quite realize the impact until you know later on down the line but i just feel um i think you know some people just want us to all just suddenly go back to normal and for a lot of people young people and you know uh all people of all ages you can't just suddenly go back to normal and expect everything just to kind of carry on the way it was so um our charity is all about yeah putting trying to put help and support in place for young people families teachers as well you know anyone working with with young people it's just yeah. not enough not enough support yeah amazing and the um uh kind of uh, how far into this are you now in terms of kind of weaponizing this uh, amazing charity 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, if I'm honest, it's taken a while because... Oh, yeah, uh, it's not an easy one. It's not easy, no. And I naively maybe thought, oh, I'll just set a charity up and it will just be... It's, it's, it's not. It's not easy and it takes a lot of work and dedication and... Yeah. Um, you know, there can be lots of changes and uh, that's fine. Um, it's, all, it's all part of the journey. But now, I think now we have moved forward and we've got a really strong, we actually got a really strong youth board because I really want the charity to be led by a young, too often young people don't get their voices heard and, you know, they tell us, well, like commissioners in the health services often, you know, tell young people what they mm. should be doing. Or, or what they need rather than listening to the young people themselves so yeah. we've got a strong youth board and i uh, want them to sort of drive things forward so yeah i think we're in a good place um that's, uh, that's such a that's so valuable isn't it sorry to interrupt you but the the idea of, of it being led by the audience is something that actually most charities and businesses have kind of neglected for so long um uh, it seems so logical and yet it just doesn't happen uh and uh, like what the heck do we know about young people's challenges like i haven't been young for 30 years so you know i need i need people like my son who's 10 telling me what challenges he's going through right now yeah. so so just it's so important it's so important absolutely absolutely yeah i mean um you know they uh, i guess people that have lived experience they often call them experts by experience mm. uh, they are they are that you know people with that lived experience uh, they are. They are the real, true experts. Not taking anything away from the professional reports, but, um, well, I've been talking a lot about, um, I don't know why recently, talk, I've been talking a lot about people being listened to, like really listened to. And again, I think particularly this after, during this period and after this period, we really need to start listening to what people need and want because the world's changed and we can't stop, you know, just shutting out people that we don't want to listen to or we think we're right like i mean i've been speaking to lots of people who have you know uh really strong anxiety worry about particular things going back to life after the lockdown and yeah. you know people are dismissing them and saying oh I'll just get on with it and you know oh we're all it's all been tough ever. Well, no listen to those people and you know see what they need and you know um i really hope things change maybe after this period and i don't know people yeah. are more open to what other people um need i really hope so yeah i agree what about you uh, terry are you are you worried about the community around you uh going think, back to kind of some kind of normal uh, like if you've if you felt any shockwaves from what's going on and i, I think coming back to what johnny was saying is there is an issue around decision makers doing things to people and not with people. There's definitely that challenge been going on for years now. Um, and, and to actually listen to what people want and what people, it's not necessarily what you think they need, it's what they feel they need and what they feel they want. It's mm. something that, that isn't really taken into consideration. We're still working from a very top down kind of approach to people's health and well-being, And we don't actually, as a rule, try and deal with it until it becomes a problem, which is, which is the wrong way around. It, it, it yeah. seriously seems to be turned on its head. Um, in respect of communities, I, th I think in, in, in for Birmingham, where I'm on the outskirts of Birmingham, working in Birmingham alongside community, what I mean, it's been a massive shock to the system there. Um, the extent to which this is going to have ramifications, that the concept of being normal again in the future, and that, that actually occurring is, is something, as, as we all say, is, is something I can't see for the foreseeable future, definitely. Um, I'd like to think that people will learn from it. I'd like to think that you can start working more closely together. I do have concerns that sometimes people forget, unfortunately, um, yeah. or it's something that happened in the past. And I think there's a real opportunity to learn from this, but I think often people get kind of get caught up in, in, in the sway of things. It's, it's like the, the Second World War, people say after the Second World War, okay, we're gonna mm -hmm. change things, we're gonna make sure that we have a welfare state and everyone is equal and everyone has the right equal access to society and all its opportunities. But to be honest, that didn't last long. You know, it's this kind of situation. We, we all need to work together, but some of us are struggling more than others. And that's because we, we don't live in an equal society. And in, in many pockets of Birmingham, it, it, it's an absolute nightmare, especially we have um, a, a large density of BME populations, for example, or certain communities that are more vulnerable, not because they're black, mm -hmm. and not because they're not because they're, they're, they're more prone to it genetically. It's, it's just because they're, the inequality, the lifestyle, um, and because 
they don't have the opportunity that many others do because we live in a society unfortunately that is even if it's covertly it is it is prejudice unfortunately some people yeah. benefit more than others yeah it's, it's interesting actually we named this episode uh of of the series um you know do are people vulnerable or do other people make people vulnerable like as a as a kind of concept you know are people inherently vulnerable or like does society make them vulnerable uh, as a kind of philosophical thought and uh, i think you just summed that up uh, brilliantly um i've got an interesting question for both of you um uh and it's to do with the kind of the men's mental health stuff um and then we'll kind of go through uh, some of the other stuff i want to chat to you about as well but i think given given that we're um guys we all have a, a particular kind of uh, a lean in this area to try and solve some of the problems and stuff quite a lot of the people that we speak to uh, at valor that i speak to as a kind of campaigner and activist outside of, of my kind of professional role just as a human being um like there's a lot of people, a lot of men that I speak to on the football walks that we do and some of the kind of the grassroots stuff that we do who kind of live with mental health problems and challenges, probably aren't talking to their peers about it. But the vast, vast majority of the people that I speak to want to actively help their friends uh, mm -hmm. who are suffering from mental health problems. Like how do we try and flip that? How do we try and flip it from men not talking about their own issues not all the time but you know quite a lot of the time to but always wanting to help other people how do we kind of try and encourage people to start seeking their own help or saying i need some support i need some help um and i just i think you two are probably gonna have some amazing uh, points of view on this uh, i genuinely agree uh, johnny how do we get people to start asking for help well we need to i mean you know, I mentioned young people, who, and we need to start from from, a, from an early age. We need to start from an early age. Um, I go into school. I went into my old school actually. Uh, I think it was last year, and you know, I, I gave uh, gave a talk to, to to students, and it's always the same when I go into school. You know, like often, and I'm generalising, but often, um, you know, the the female students will put their hand up straight away and talk. And then it's the it's, it's the it's the boys that um, you know maybe they'll wait around at the end uh, and ask me a question like on, on their own when everyone's left you know they're really embarrassed and I remember I was talking to one one boy um, at my old school and he was bless him he was he was he was really struggling and he he just said to me he's like you know what like no matter what you've just come in and told us I'm not going to tell my, my my mates that I'm struggling. And this boy is, was 16, so it gets ingrained from a from a certain age about you know, not it's not okay to be vulnerable to ask for help, particularly mm -hmm. for, for boys. But I mean, for me, it needs to start in primary schools. It has yeah. to start in primary schools, you know. Um, I think that yeah, I mean, there's an age around like I don't know six, seven, eight where boys, uh, you know, boys start getting the message of you know if, if they're if they're struggling or, or, or they're being vulnerable, it's like, come on, you know, you're a big boy now. You know, uh, big boys don't cry, and we're still giving us, us, we're still giving boys that message of it's not okay to, yeah, to to not be okay and to, to ask for help. So for me, it has to start from from a young young age, you know, because um, you know we we encourage young people to talk and ask for help if they've got physical problem uh, physical. I mean we place so much emphasis on certain things like you know dental health from 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 a young age um you know I mean uh, when I was growing up it was you know this it was kind of drilled into me excuse the pun it was drilled into me about my the importance <laughs> of looking after my dental health but nothing about my mental health nothing so when yeah. I started struggling I was like this is this this is embarrassing and I can't I'm not to tell anyone so yeah from a young age it needs to start, needs to start. yeah and do you do, it, do it when you, but you still don't think it's happening you still don't think that you know schools put a little bit that, uh, some schools put a lot of effort into pastoral care and you know there's a but it's not it's not a kind of or it's a topic rather than a a, a kind of a culture like it's yeah. a it's a lesson it's replaced religious education um it's still not quite kind of cultural within establishments yet right 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going into schools now, and I'm saying because schools often say to me, "Oh, Johnny, can you come in and give a talk for an hour on World Mental Health Day to our students?" And I'm like, "Well, okay, but what else are you doing? Like, I'm not just going to yeah, come yeah. in." Well, I mean, that sounds really. I just, I don't want to just come in and talk. I, I went to one. This was, I went to one school again about it was last year, and I gave a talk, and um, the teachers. Uh, I, get, I gave my talk and then the teachers were like, right, everyone back to lessons. And I was like, hold on a second, give these people a chance to digest and, you know, to ask questions. And they were like, no, we don't have time, got to get them back to lessons. And I was really angry. I was like, uh, please don't do that again to the school. I was like, you know, because there were young people I know I could see that needed to talk. Um, we've got to stop doing this thing of uh, like this tick box thing, not just in schools, it happens in workplaces. It's like, uh, oh, we'll get a mental speaker in and it's covered, it's done tick box um that needs to stop it needs to yeah. stop it's about changing the environment yeah amazing uh, terry what do you think how do you how do you get people to start talking more positively as well not just mm. social, Absolutely. social media is not a good place to talk about your gender to a large degree i, I, I believe is definitely determined what society you live in and, and they they deem what you as a boy and what you as a girl should be be like and I should behave. I mean, I was brought up in the 1970s and uh, I was brought up on the Peter and Jane books. You might remember the Peter and Jane books, the Janet and John books where, where Peter mm. helps his dad fix the roof and Jane helps her mum bake the cakes for, you know, for Peter and his dad. And that, that's brought up in, in, in you and still in you from a very young age. I've got a grandfather who fought in Dunkirk and a father who worked in the steel yards. He was he also eyesight difficulties, but never talked about it. They never talked about the war. They never kind of opened up about that kind of thing. And that's instilled in you from a very, very young age. It's very, very strong. And there is a reason why men in their 50s, which is my age as of last week, so there's definitely a reason why men in their 50s are the most at risk in respect of suicidal thoughts and, and even taking their own lives, unfortunately. And it's a way that 10 years ago, which are 40-year-olds, and, and 20 years ago, which are 30-year-olds, it's the same group, it's the same men. It's what they call Generation X. So, and that's about how your gender determined or socialised into you from a very young age. If you fall outside of that, or if you fall right in it and become that stereotype, you can't ask for help. Um, mm -hmm. and we've got the same thing now, and John is dead right, because the next wave is the younger generation. We're talking um, young women um, and men in their kind of teens to 20s, and they're the next wave. So what are we going to do there that's going to be different to help those people realise, I can be me, I can speak up, um, and I'm not going to feel, I'm not going to feel that's weak. It's actually stronger to speak up. But, how we do that you definitely needs something at a curriculum level like, like yeah. Johnny say it's not a tick box scenario i mean i've, I've had doctors say to me can you come in and, get, and give us a, a checklist for suicide prevention i'm like absolutely not you know and they say we'll pay you and they say, it's really not about the money if you want to be effective at doing this stuff you've got to take it seriously you've got to build into how your organization works and how you treat people and how you see people and at the moment we're still falling into those dimensions of this is your role and this is their role and this is how society works yeah. Um, and it's a struggle for anyone to, to, to pull out of that without wider realization that each and every individual is an individual. And yeah. it's, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. And I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. Yeah. Definitely not. Well, I mean, sorry. I agree with, I agree with all of that. Uh, you know, without me, we're not there, but um, I, it, at least people like us are having the conversation. Do you know what I mean? And like, it's not good enough and it needs more needs to be done. and. We're all kind of hammering it. And it is a grassroots uh, movement that needs to kind of push this up and not this top down thing. But yeah, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I mean, one, so, uh, and I'm just saying this uh, before I, I ask you a, a, another question, uh, an interesting one I've got. Um, uh, the way that I parent uh, changed after man made. And it, it wasn't that I was necessarily, in my view, doing anything wrong. Um, you know, I just learned so much about me and everybody else and the views on that day, that one day that, you know, I started going out with my son more for walks and just having, you know, sort of chat time that wasn't about anything, just like, how's it going? Like we started, you know, making more, uh, started going to the football together more and just having that time that felt... Uh, Again, quite stereotypical, but actually it ended up being quite healthy to spend that time asking him how he was getting on mm -hmm. uh, and, and almost finding some of those stereotypes that, um, and, and kind of using and abusing them as a way of getting him to open up about his stuff as well. So, uh, But yeah, I think more needs to be done, definitely. 
Um, so look, uh, I've got a really interesting question, uh, and I know I want to have a little chat about lockdown actually, because given that we're in the middle, well, we're kind of coming out the end of it. Um, but this one is, is something that is probably going to be quite tough uh, to answer, and not many of the guests that I've asked it to. And there's a reason I asked the group of people that I asked to come and have these conversations with me. This is one thing that, that bonds you all together. Um, kind of over the years that I, I've really got to know you both um, uh, on a professional and a personal level, uh, there seems to be this kind of sense of optimism um, that, that bubbles in certain types of people and bubbles in you. Uh, I think maybe people that have lived through uh, a crisis and come out the other side seem to have this kind of sense of optimism. Um, where, do you, where does your sense of optimism come from? Uh, uh, Johnny, do you wanna, do, where, do you, where do you get your optimism from? Uh, Apart from a box of rice, apart from a box of rice, which is like leaking, leaking everywhere. Where'd you I get your to from? Open it before we finish and reveal all. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like it's like the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, my, uh, my optimism. I, I, I might sound like a bit of a broken record, but my optimism comes from the young people that I work with, to be honest, yeah. because. Um, I mean, uh, you know, they're in their teens and 20s and they are so open about their mental health and they've got so much knowledge and wisdom. And I'm thinking back to when I was in my teens and 20s and um, I'm in my early 30s now. And um, yeah, I had no, I had no language around mental health. I didn't have any understanding. I, de I definitely didn't have any like wisdom. And that's really, I just find it so encouraging that you know, the young, these young people are, A, they're willing to talk about it, but B, they want to see change. Uh, mm. Kind of like, you know, with, with, with um, young people, the way that they are so involved with the climate change. Yeah. Process. I mean, I think that's it's so powerful. And, and uh, yeah, I'm seeing more and more young people. Mm. Young people are, you know, they want a change in the system, particularly the mental health system. Yeah. Um, we know that the mental health system particularly for, for young people, hasn't been working for a lot of young people for, for a long time. And so I'm seeing the next generation really try and uh, fight for, for, for it. And that's really encouraging, you know. Yeah. I, 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 that, I, whenever I'm feeling a bit, um, I don't know, uh, a, bit, a bit lost or a bit kind of, well, lacking in optimism, I, I go to these... <laughs> Uh, young people, I uh, talk to them and just instantly, you know, hear about the apps they're creating or the books they're writing. Or, yeah, and I'm just like, wow, like, yeah, uh, the yeah. future is, is bright. There are, yeah, activism is definitely going to take on a whole new shape in the next couple of years. Uh, incidentally, uh, and then I'm going to ask Terry, here's a little tip for anybody listening. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures is the band The 1975, right? Uh, uh, which, you know, is one of the cool bands that all the kids love these days. Uh, but they're a good band, maybe because they found like 80s music and there's nothing wrong with that. Anyway, uh, the new album that came out last week, the, I put it on. The very first track is the Greta Thurm Thurnberg speech from last year, the kind of six minute uh, dialogue about rebellion. Um, and honestly, I was walking the dog and I put it on and I went, how old is this lady, this girl? Like, she's like, 16 or something um when i listened to it i went i completely understand now why the youth are rising up mm -hmm. on issues like climate change you listen to this honestly it was just incredible and articulate and and i went the next generation are going to bust us open like they're going to absolutely destroy all of this stuff i mean just uh, very very powerful very and very optimistic as well terry where do you get your optimism from my friend I guess in, in many different ways, but it's um, if, you look, if you look backwards, I'm, I think about, about family, you know, and, and, and the, positive, the positive influences from them, in, in spite of everything they went through. Um, mm. My friends around today, um, but also, I mean, if, if talking from a, a mental health perspective, and, and it's very true that things aren't moving as quick as they should do. But these issues around, around mental health, they are trying. Things have changed. We are we are trying to make a difference. You are finding that, that some decision makers are starting to realise actually, you know, having a service that goes up to 16 years old and then dropping it for two years, then picking back up at 18 when they're struggling again. They're trying to deal with that, not without the pitfalls, I must admit. 
Uh, but I'm optimistic is because they, they're starting to realise that there is an evidence base around prevention, there is an evidence base around possibility uh, and helping people turn their lives around. And, and to, to, to ignore that um, would kind of be the death of all of us, if you like. It would just, just feel like it's not worth going on anymore. There's too many positive things that are still there, and it's, it's gaining ground, definitely gaining ground, and more and more people are signing up to it. Um, with regard to younger people, I've got four, when I say children, but four, <laughs> four, four children of ages 17 and 22. Um, and they're very, very powerful, very strong, very determined, and they want to make that difference. And it feels like they've picked up the mantle from what maybe I put down back in the 1980s and saying, Let, let's push for this, let's really work hard, let's, let's not just sort of get a day off school, let's go out there, let's demonstrate, let's, let's make a difference, yeah. Let, let's say what we're going to say, our piece. So there is definitely a grand swell for change. And I think yeah. that, that that just keeps you going, keeps you ticking over. Mm. Um, and it's also, it's also the feedback I've got from people I've worked with. Um, even just uh, today, for example, I was chatting to a 70 odd year old bloke who got in touch with me, got my number from somewhere, um, just in respect to the fact that he lost his benefits and his partner had died and didn't know who to talk to. But it just took a, a 10 minute conversation between me, me and him um, for me to go on the internet to find the right phone number to get in touch with that, that particular sector for them to get in touch with him. And I got a little text message saying, Thanks a lot, made my day, made a big difference, and we can move on. You know what I mean, and that, that's the kind of thing. There, there, there is always a way through this, but we have to work on it together. So, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. well, that whole, isn't it? I call them um, uh, little, <laughs> big, little big things. Yeah, and uh, that all those. If everybody did more kind of little big things, the world would be a much better place. If everybody spent ten minutes talking to a vulnerable eighty-year-old mm -hmm. uh, to try and help them overcome a problem, or a you know uh, a confused ten-year-old. At uh, the other end, uh, I think the world will be a slightly safer place. Um, amazing stuff. So look, uh, so I'm, I'm talking to interesting people in my life about COVID and what it means. Um, uh, it, was so, it feels like we're kind of coming to the end of the lockdown now, which is good, although uh, in some ways, I think it's going to make a lot more people anxious. Um, what do you like? So much has happened in such a sp short space of time this year. 2020 was not supposed to be like this. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't definitely not supposed to be like this. Um, and really in a way that not even the scientists could have predicted. Um, how do you think all this has been handled? Uh, and I don't just mean kind of governmentally, which you can talk about, but like on a personal level as well, like uh, how, how has all this been dealt with? Has it been dealt with well? Has it been dealt with badly? Is, are people, is mental health going to have taken a massive dent because of anxiety? What do you think? Johnny, what do you think? Well, I mean, don't really get me started on the government. <laughs> 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 well, um, do it. Well, I mean, I don't know. Because I mean, do you know what I'm really? Uh, just I think that there's a lot of anger at the moment yeah. towards, and quite rightly so. And I I do worry actually about because we had you know we had Brexit right at the beginning of well it's been going on well Brexit went on for such a long time and it felt like it divided everyone. Yeah. And then, you know, we had this period and I thought, oh, OK, you know, I wonder if this period will like bring us closer together as a sort of society. And now what I'm seeing is more division because you've got the sort of, I mean, like, so it takes social media. I mean, obviously, because of the situation with the government and, you know, very recently uh, with a certain Mr. Cummings, um, <laughs> it's really, it's divided, it's really divided and really in a, in a real um it remind, it's reminding me of Brexit again, the way that people are talking to each other, you know, two and it's making me, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm angry at the government, I'm frustrated at the government, but I'm also frustrated at um, just the, well, what I'm seeing in, in society when I thought that maybe, and I hope I'm wrong, I hope this, this difficult period will, um, I don't know, come to an end and maybe we will join up again more. It's just, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't know why in my head I was like, you know, as soon as we come out of lockdown, hopefully people are going to have like street parties and we're going to join together and all celebrate as one. But maybe I'm being that's optimistic. Maybe I'm being too optimistic about that. But um, I just, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think it's been handled great. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I guess I'm a little bit uh, just a little bit worried, I suppose, about. Um, the sort of anger levels, the anger yeah. frustration, and because anger is justified and anger is is fine. I think you know we all have this thing of um, 
Oh, angry. We're scared of anger. But, you know, going back to like the climate change protest, you know, that comes from a place of anger. And anger is, is good, but we just need to use it in the, in the right yeah. way. I kind of hope, uh, I don't know, I hope that maybe coming out of this period, maybe we will join back together again. It's just been such years of division, in, in, particularly in, this, in the UK. It's been years of division because of things like Brexit. Really hope that we join up again. I hope so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm with you on that one, my friend. Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, I, I've started to not watch the news, mm. uh, which is quite tragic because actually it's kind of important to keep up with current affairs, sort of. Uh, social media, like, oh, it's like a bear pit, isn't it? Um, yeah. The lessons of uh, of dear Caroline Flack oh, seem yeah. to have been forgotten quite quickly, don't they, even over the weekend? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, you know, just recently we had Mental Health Awareness Week with its theme as kindness. Yeah. And <laughs> again, kind of similar to what, I mean, what Terry said about, you know, we forget so, so quickly and so easily because our world moves so fast. And, yeah. you know, I just, I don't know. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Terry, uh, yeah, ter 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 Terry, you must be the the opposite view. You must think the uh, government's handled this brilliantly. Oh, <laughs> Don't stop me off. It's, um, it's uh, I think, that, uh, I'm being diplomatic here. I think the sad thing, the, the, the biggest, saddest thing is, 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 is the obvious stuff. Um, we get so wound up in all the political stuff and the comings and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, we forget about all the people that have died. Well, don't forget about them. We just, I mean, just push to one corner. All the people that are grieving and what they're going through, the number yeah. of people having to demand of the helplines and how we haven't got services to meet those needs with regards to helplines, the number of people that experience domestic violence yeah. in a lot of situation and not knowing where to turn to. I run the waiting room. I, I co-run with Community the waiting room, which is an online directory for Birmingham and Solihull. Um, it's really hard work. We're trying to update this directory to make sure it, it, meets the needs of the local communities um but the hit rates that we're getting the number of people that are going through to helplines to mental health support to young people support to homelessness support to areas that, that relate to domestic violence it's astronomical absolutely just um just to advertise this just to av take a minute and advertise this because some people won't know what the waiting room is and it's oh, astonishing sorry. So, so, so the, the waiting room is an online director. We built it specifically for people, not for professionals, for people. So it's a website, which is the hyphen waiting room dot org. It has 24 areas, 24 sections. And whatever your need is or whatever you're, 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 whatever you're looking for, hopefully it'll be on there with regard to local services and local support. We're not just talking about mental health. We'll have mm -hmm. physical health, sexuality, sexual health. Mm -hmm. Uh, faith communities, um, supporting families, uh, welfare advice, all yeah. these things. Just a click of a button takes you straight through and loads of information on it. But behind that, direct to the astronomical increase in respect of um, those services that are in much dire need uh, during, this, during this pandemic means that we know that the knock on effect is going to be huge. Yeah. Um, and for me to be blunt from a, well, from a personal perspective, Things were known much earlier in respect of how big this is going to be. Things could have been done much sooner. But the countries did things in a way that was much much more able to deal with the outcome in a, yeah. in a much more efficient manner. Mm. And unfortunately, we've lost thousands of lives. I can remember people saying, oh, you know, 20,000 will be, will be a, a, a conservative estimate. Well it, well, it is conservative. It's going up and up and up. And, and these are not just deaths purely from COVID. It's those people that don't want to bother the NHS yeah. uh, or don't want to catch COVID so don't engage with the NHS. So it's a massive issue. Um, and you can't, you can't forget, and, and I can't forget, I know how much NHS has been absolutely hammered with regard to finances, with regard to staffing, with regard to its provision over the last 10 years. And to turn around now and, and not take any responsibility for that from a political perspective, I, I think it's a shame. Yeah, well, a sham, actually, yeah. is probably a better word. Uh, very much so. Because <laughs> it's great. I mean, it is so. Yeah. So it is a tricky one. But do you think, I mean, I mean look, the other thing that, that uh, I've spotted over the last couple of months um, is that, you know, I've always, I've always had a, a, an interest and also an issue in language, right? And so, you know, language carries so much weight. Uh, the way that we speak 
the the way that we communicate you know the effect that language has on people and society and how it kind of you know inspires anger or inspires confusion or whatever like do you think that globally the language of this has been so bad like social isolation and distance and like how do you think how do you think the language has been dealt with go on johnny and, okay, I wasn't, um, yeah i think uh well kind of like you actually i mean in the very uh pete you know you were saying about you stopped looking at the news so at the very beginning of um this whole period i was you know i was trying to stop the news and um you know, look at, take a look at the newspaper and newspapers and the newspaper headlines. Wow. I mean, um, talk about, and I, I get it, I get it. You know, they, they obviously uh, had, had their concerns, but I mean, the kind of the scaremongering language in particular. Um, and I just, I, I, I ended up stopping reading the news, uh, looking at newspapers uh, because it was just, yeah, the particularly the language is just so um, just just ter just terrifying, terrifying, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I know for myself it wasn't good for my mental health, you know. Mm. Uh, so I started reading, um, you know, the, the BBC started to develop a, like a good news sort of section of all the good that people are doing, um, and I started to read that, and I know that sounds like I'm I'm, I'm shutting off from the news. And, no, 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 not at all. I think lots of people have. Well, you got to do what's what's right for you, really. Uh, you have to, yeah, you have to. Um, and for me, at one point, I was like, I just can't, just can't do this anymore. So I was just focusing on the like all the good that people were doing. I mean, like Captain Tom, like do you know what I mean? Like that was such a maybe. I was trying to like find more more positive stories like that yeah. Um, because yeah, the 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 language and yeah, particularly with the media. Um, well, I mean, the media have done this for a long time, haven't they, in terms of uh, scaremongering. Um, Sells well. Yeah. So uh, I think I think the media also needs to maybe... I mean, if you look at what's happening with the media at the moment, um, going back to sort of like the, the situation with like the government and Dominic Cummings, I mean, um, you know, the, you see the media literally like um, packed outside his house uh kind of chasing him and um i i get that they you know there's a story they need to cover but the way they go about it and i i just i get very frustrated again lessons are never learned never yeah. learned from other uh well for example with caroline black uh you know lessons and uh, you know it, with many people before caroline black yeah amy winehouse like the way the media press treated her um lessons i've just never ever ever learned i just wonder what it's going to take really yeah. for, you know that's very negative but no 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 well it's valuable uh and it, i think you know you pretty much summarized how i think a portion of society is thinking at the moment i don't know if it's all of them i think yeah. some people are taking their frustrations out on you know the invisible people because they're on social media platforms or whatever. Oh, they're not real people. I can say whatever I like. It could be vile, but um, yeah, words carry weight. Um, Terry, do you think the um, the present's kind of has the present kind of funda fundamentally reshaped tomorrow, uh, or do you think it was kind of always inevitable that these sort of natural disaster black swan events would happen, and you know, as a species, we were just going to go back to normal? Like, do you think everything is now changed, or do you think? Um, and we've kind of covered it a little bit. Like, do you think do you think it's going to be the same or different after all of this? And I, I think for a period of time there'll be a, a, a new a new normal, I guess. But I, I think over time it will slip back. I, I think those, those those divisions will will, will slip back. Just something to touch on before in respect to um, in respect to language. Um, the problem is also um, the fear mongering, fear mongering that's going on is. is, is you find that on social media and things like that. There's a there's a there's an online um, there's an online place uh, with regard to uh, local communities. So you can join it and you can see what's happening down your street and what's happening in your area, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And that starts to become a place where people start to demonise individuals. So it happens at a local level. It's not even just a, a national thing where people say, "Have you seen this family over here? They're playing out on the playing fields and they live." You know that that kind of stuff. And what do they yeah. think? 
just be just there look not to get it and we all have to catch it and you know it, it gets and they've got people turn against people I don't, I don't think it's helpful at all i think i think to a certain degree it's, it's become a bit too much of a uh a bit, bit of nanny state where we're told what we need to do where we need to go how we need to act but we're not that stupid we yeah more involved in the conversation from the very beginning i think um yeah. do i think we're going to return to a uh a new well it's uh, normal i think eventually i think <laughs> people's memories aren't as long as what we'd like them to be and i don't think this will have as much of an impact as we, we, we'd like it to have i yeah. think if they found a cure tomorrow or um yeah an antidote for it tomorrow i think just, just basically we'll just go back to normal within weeks it just it just wouldn't have that long-term impact yeah people soon fall back into this is mine and that is yours and you're not coming across here you know what i mean it's it's uh it's a shame and maybe you talk about optimism sometimes in some aspects i, I don't feel as optimistic as i'd like to i, I yeah. couldn't be wrong and i hope i'm proved wrong i really do yeah i've seen a, I've, I've seen a couple of really interesting things recently about that kind of community optimism uh, and how like there's an app that popped up just last week a couple of developers built something called favorhood so if you search for favorhood in the uh, the app store uh, it was literally built in kind of three or four weeks and it's immaculately done as well it's very high quality and it's for lo like communities to all effectively volunteer to do stuff for each other um and it was kind of inspired by the early weeks of lockdown and they went well like we should probably weaponize that goodwill that came out for a while um and so I think there have been some really interesting stuff, but yeah, I mean, I fear I fear you are correct. I think we we will listen uh, for a while and then forget. Um, look, I, I, we're go, we're sort of running out of time. Johnny's got a box of rice there. Can, open the box. What's in the box? Uh, and then I've got a couple of quick fire questions for you. Oh, it's about this forever. My, sorry, my floor is like soaked in something. What's in oh, the box? Sorry, sorry. Uh, the story of this. Um, what did just well, Johnny's opening his box, Terry. Uh, give us a couple of tips. What kind of cause obviously, I run uh, Vala, the uh, health and, and well being um, online GP service, and we talk quite a lot about people about things that they could and should be doing to keep themselves mentally fit and healthy and kind of physically fit and healthy. Are there any things that we should probably be doing more of? Uh, during lockdown and, and post lockdown that will just kind of i don't know boost us a little bit i think i mean from from a, just from a psychological perspective is, is just asking people how they are and actually actually asking you know, when you ask that question how are you and people say i'm fine actually mean it when you ask that question how are you and if they say they're fine just double check on that one yeah um the, the idea i think we've got some data come through only a couple of days ago that's saying that in, the amount of people that hadn't been seen by their neighbours in the last, have you visited your neighbours in the last month, like that kind of data coming through. And 40 odd percent had in certain areas, but that means that 60 odd percent, not good at maths, 60 odd percent in other areas didn't, you know what I mean? So it's kind of, there are people that are out there that are alone that are really, really struggling. And we have to remember, well, we are all in this together. You know, we have to support yeah. as much as possible. Uh, with, the, with regards to personal level, I mean, be open, be honest. If you're having a crap day, say, I'm, I'm, I'm having a crap day. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and for me, it's, um, it's either music or it's cycling or it's reading. Uh, you know what I mean? But there are ways to look after our mental health that are over and above what they'd say in the, maybe the medical yeah, yeah. profession. You know, but we have to do what we what we can do for the best of ourselves and those around us. What have you been doing, Johnny? What have you been doing to keep yourself kind of fit and well, apart from buying boxes of rice? Can I just kind of show you, right? Go on, let's do it. Let's do it. That's, no, what, I'm, I'm, that's what the public really want to see. What's in the box? In the box. So, right, this big box, right? <laughs> big box. Big box. No! Was that it? That's amazing. You are lying. Seriously. So hey. But, you know, really? That's... The Oh, that's a that that's a that's a public health disaster right there. We should have spoken about we should have spoken about, spoken about the, and and presumably it was del delivered on a petrol powered motorcycle of some kind as well. Exactly, amazing. Yeah. Oh no, it's I thought we were guilty now. It's a national tragedy. That's what yeah. we, we should be talking about. Johnny's box of two okay. things, not Dominic Cummings. Um, what have you been doing? What have you been doing to keep yourself fit and well, Johnny? Um, so, uh, it, it, you know, similar to what Terry said, I mean, you know, 
yeah, I've had some bad days, as we all as we all have during lockdown. Some days where I'm just fed up and frustrated, and being kind to myself during those days and giving myself a break. So you know, actually, sweat. You know, there's been and also there's been a lot of uh, I've had a lot of like meetings online and. Yeah. You know, sometimes that can be really exhausting, to be honest. And actually, yeah, giving myself a break about that. Um, so, and, and you know, saying no, if, if, you know, I get to the end of the day and I've got someone that I've, I, I say, can we just move it to tomorrow, maybe? Because I'm just, so really trying to, yeah, just be, be kind to myself, be gentle on myself and um, switch, really switch it. Because it's so easy, isn't it, to just keep, you know, with this bot, with this, with this, laptop just keep yeah, yeah, yeah. away and um it's not good when i when i do that so yes really really switching off um, well, that, is, that is why i appreciate you two taking an hour out of your evening to come and sit in front of a screen and chat to me because yeah. uh, everybody is kind of fatigued by this stuff right i've got a couple of quick ones for you so that anybody that's tuned in knows you a bit better afterwards uh uh we'll start with johnny your favorite book oh um that's 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 tough. There's there's there's, there's many. Oh, um, uh, can I name two? Can I name two? Ah, oh, go on then. Yeah, I'll give you two. All right, cool. Uh, so, man, man, search for meaning. Okay. Uh, Victor Frankl, which is just astounding. Um, and uh, uh, Tuesdays, Tuesdays with Maury. I don't know if anyone's read that. Mitch album. Um. Again, another just, I mean, there's just so much wisdom in, in those books. Really amazing books. Nice. Terry, favorite book? Fifty Shades of Grey. No. Oh, <laughs> no. Okay, uh, next. Well, that's the second favorite. Pro pro probably The Dice Man by Luke Reinhardt. It was a bo book I read in my teens. Um, it's about a guy who uh, decides one morning when he wakes up that he's going to let his choices for that day be made by the roll of the dice, or a die, sorry. Um, and that kind of takes over his whole life and it shows how life could be lived to a certain degree by by chance of looking floor uh, and the effects that has on him it's also called the hippie handbook um, many hippies in the 1970s and 80s would use it to decide whether or not to get out of bed or to smoke the next to smoke the next hashish so it's kind of like you know it's got a bit of a cool following but that's the only book that if i find it in a second hand bookshop i will buy it and give it to someone nice yeah I so. I'll, tell, I'll tell you what i read recently which uh, in fact i read it a while ago and i reread it was um grace and perry's the descent of man okay. oh, that that is a good book that i mean that's an astonishing book it was really amazing and that comes back to your points about stereotypes as well it's kind of you know the pink and blue thing how we define children's identities by the way we treat them even from the minute they're kind of born so just an astonishing book absolutely profound uh okay quickly um Terry, favourite movie? Uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Good. Donny, Johnny, favourite movie? Oh, again, uh, can I... So, no. I mean, one, one. So, up, up, up. I love up. Very good. Yeah, oh, no. I, cried, I cried a lot. I cried a lot. Uh, uh, favourite song, Johnny? Questions. Um, um, Political ones, you can just bang them out, do you know what I mean? But favourite song, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um... Uh, oh my gosh! Wait, Terry, what's your Terry? What's your Terry? Song? What's yours? Uh, probably uh, David Bowie. Probably uh, let's let's go with Life on Mars. Very good, very good, good stuff. Pete, what's yours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 it varies with my mood, if I'm honest. But uh, at the moment, because of lockdown, I've been uh, absorbing quite a lot of Chopin. So I'll take I'll take one of the. Uh, the requiems in E minor or something like that. You're so cultured. So cultured. No, no, honestly, it just helps my brain switch off. I've been doing like 14 hour days and I just yeah. need something that's not like upbeat. I need something that's kind of a downer yeah. uh, to just switch off and look out the window and stare at the sky. Uh, so that's cool. Um, okay, look, I'm, I'm going to leave you to the rest of your evening. Uh, however, I do want to know just before we finish um, what's next for both of you in the next 12 months or so? Uh, have you got anything planned? Johnny, what's the what's keeping you busy and going to keep you busy for the next 12 months so i'm, I'm, I'm finishing off a book at the moment um hmm. which is well we're calling it the book of hope and uh yeah it's it's um you know because my first book was was kind of my own personal story which, which 
was pretty heavy. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, yeah, let me just, sorry to interrupt you, uh, it's my prerogative to do so, I am just going to plug it, uh, The Man on the Bridge, uh, what, it, The Man on the Bridge was the name oh, of the book. Stranger, Stranger, Stranger. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah. how rude of me, because uh, I've read it a dozen times. Uh, it's an astonishing book, like, and I knew, I knew the story anyway, and I knew you, which was kind of weird reading, like, mm. a friend's book, do you know what I mean, all the photos and stuff, but everybody watching this, like, buy or borrow this book, it's, it's really quite an astonishing uh, memoir of uh, a story that you know uh, needs to be told so anyway you say so you're doing another book yeah this is focused more on on hope hope and um uh because hope for me particularly in the last well <laughs> particularly in this current climate hope and again optimism it's it are so valuable i mean so valuable um so it's a book that hopefully people will find yeah some hope in um themselves i just think there's not enough hope in this world yeah it's so powerful so powerful tool amazing terry what, what's going to keep you busy for the next 12 months or so at, at the moment it's, it's developing suicide prevention training programs that are available online that that is that in the way team is my, my main core work and, and developing man made to be available online as well so that's actually like kind of face to face a bit like this um but with less personal questions, hopefully, that, that's that's fine. But definitely, the suicide prevention um, angle. We need to look at a way to get people to engage around suicide prevention and understand suicide mm. and suicidal thought. But at the same time, doing a way that's safe. Um, so you got to get. There's lots out there where people can kind of tick boxes and just move on and say, "Yes, here's a certificate." But to be honest, there's there's no face to face contact during mm. that process. And I think that's a, that's that's a dangerous point. There are many people unfortunately dying this way and fortunately it's likely they're going to have the same or a greater number in the future with devastating effect um so how we deal with it requires a lot more thought i think is currently being practiced right yeah. so that's amazing uh, li listen uh, uh, you probably don't give yourselves enough credit uh i struggle to do it uh, the amount of lives that both of you have saved uh, over the years Un unbeknowingly uh, I'm imagining combined between the two of you is an astonishing number uh, and they're almost impossible measurements because you know they're the they're the ones that can't be measured the lives saved are the ones that you know uh, thankfully we don't get the the coroner's report for and your your contribution to men's mental health and suicide prevention and inspiring people to talk and 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 is is immeasurable and uh like i need to thank you both for being a positive influence in my life and making a huge contribution to my mental well-being uh the world i know will, will look back on you very fondly uh, or look at you right now very fondly in terms of what you're doing um please keep doing it because it makes a massive difference uh thank you for letting me steal an hour of your your very busy lives on a wednesday evening with a box of leaking rice um uh be well and uh uh, well, I think we should all catch up after the uh, the lockdown is is behind yeah. us, and we'll all have a we'll all have a hug, which <laughs> which is you know, it's illegal at the moment, but we'll all have a cuddle. Um, anyway, look, um, my friend, we could we could have one over. No, we could have one right now. So someone did the other day, just like literally. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the same. Yeah. 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 Too close, too long, even at this distance. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, there's no smell. It's not tactile. I think on that note, I should probably end the broadcast because, uh, you know, but, you know, it's a first for me. So, uh, gentlemen, I love you to bits. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you soon. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Yeah. Take care. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye.